Good evening, everyone. If the public can just hold tight for a second, we are having a little bit of difficulty uh, promoting in some of the commissioners. So uh, thank you for your patience. Good evening, Chair Gall. We are live. Uh, I believe the only commissioner who is not with us just yet is Commissioner Foff. Uh, but you may begin as soon as she joins, I will promote her as a commissioner. Okay, so we uh, haven't started yet then. Uh, well, we, we the, the public has been let in, so we, we are live, but uh, anytime you're ready, you may okay. begin. All right, well, I'm sure that Jen will be with us soon. Good evening, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. Welcome to the August 22nd, 2022 City of Burlingame Planning Commission meeting. For all in attendance today, please note that this Planning Commission meeting is being held using the Zoom webinar format. So you will see that Planning Commissioners and staff are panelists. Please note that there are several, several ways to submit comments during this meeting. You may raise your hand in Zoom by clicking on the raise hand button located at the bottom of your screen. Members of the public who are participating in the Zoom webinar by phone can dial star nine to raise a hand. You may also send your comments by email to publiccomment at burlingame.org. Staff will be monitoring emails submitted during the meeting, which will be read at the appropriate time. The length of the emailed comment should be commensurate with the three minutes customarily, customarily allowed for verbal comments. If you are an applicant or an applicant's representative, I will ask you to raise your hand when your agenda item is up for discussion so that we may be prepared for you to speak at the appropriate time. We ask that you also turn on your video at that time so we can have more clear communication simulating the experience we would have if we were meeting in person. This meeting is being streamed live on YouTube and will be uploaded to the city's website after the meeting. Agenda item number two is roll call. And the record should note that all of our commissioners are present at this uh, meeting this evening. Um, okay, welcome, Jen. <laughs> uh, agenda item number three is the approval of the minutes. We have Approval of the minutes from the August 8th, 2022 regular planning commission meeting. Are there any comments, changes, or discussions regarding the minutes? I move that we approve the meeting minutes of August 8th, 2022. I'll Thank second you. that motion. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Camarado and a second by Commissioner Say. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Then can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, uh, Commissioner Camarado. Aye. Commissioner Horan. Aye. Commissioner Lowenthal. Aye. Commissioner Schmid. Sorry, aye. Uh, Commissioner Say. Aye. Vice Chair Foff. Aye. And Chair Gall. Aye. So the motion passes 7 0. Um, and with no recusals and no abs uh, absences. All right, uh, agenda item number four is the approval of the agenda. Does staff have any changes for the agenda or do we have any recusals? Uh, no chair goal, no changes to the agenda. And do we have any recusals and tonight? We are, I am not aware of any, um, no. All right, thank you. Uh, then we'll move on to agenda item number five, which is public comments, not agenda. Members of the public may speak about any item not on the agenda. Members of the public wishing to suggest an item for a future planning commission agenda may do so during the public comment period. The Ralph Brown Act, the state local agency 
open meeting law prohibits the planning commission from acting on any matter that has not that is not on the agenda. Speakers are limited to three minutes each. Please speak clearly into the microphone. Do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on any item that is not on our agenda? Do we have any emails? I see three hands raised. Um, I do want to clarify um, there's four. So this would be for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, so if uh, any of the speakers do want to talk about one of the items on the agenda, please wait until that item. Um, if it is not related to 2313 Ray Drive, 1699 Bayshore Highway, or 1200 1340 Bayshore Highway, this would be the time for that comment. Uh, so I see three hands up. So we will bring in uh, the first person you will be promoted to. This is Samsung SMG 781V. And just give us a moment while um, that individual is brought in as a panelist. And uh, you have the floor, you just need to unmute yourself and then um, we can start the clock. Give just another moment. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good evening, commissioners, staff, and members of the audience. My name is Anthony Levice. I've been a carpenter in the Bay Area for over 27 years. 23 of which have been with the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, Local 22 in San Francisco. Uh, I'm here to talk about what's best, not only for construction workers, but for Burlingame. Local hire. Local hire keeps the jobs and the money in the community you serve. A living wage. This allows our local construction workers the ability to prosper here in Burlingame. Healthcare not just for one, but for the entire family, the family as a whole. This should include vision and dental care as well. These are all things I've enjoyed for so many years as a union carpenter. I would kindly ask the commissioners, please consider adopting a requirement for all proposed developments that Bay Area standard carpenter wages provide health care coverage and a commitment to hire local carpenters as tradesmen, including apprentices. Developers and general contractors will never do the right thing and pay area standard wages on their own. With your leadership, we can send a message to all these developers and contractors that Burlingame will not stand for the exploitation of carpenters, skilled tradesmen, and apprentices so they can increase their profits. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, let me just move to Sorry, I'm uh, multitasking here. Okay, next up is uh, Stephen Goodale, and I will promote you to panelist. Give us just a second. Uh, you are in, just unmute yourself and you can go. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, I'll do my best to stay within the three minutes. Uh, my name is Stephen Goodale and I'm a member of the Sierra Club Sustainable Land Use Committee. I'm speaking on bioscience and biosafety levels and providing guidelines from the SLU, the Sustainable Land Use Committee, because the agents used in labs are often hazardous. Biosafety is highly regulated for work workers, but cities are ultimately responsible for the protection of their residents and the environment. Agents are the raw materials present in bioscience labs. Some quick examples are bacteria, parasites, recombinant DNA, and so on. They can be hazardous to neighborhoods and the environment. Biosafety levels, or BSLs, represent the less, one thing they represent, is the level of risk posed to lab workers, neighborhoods, and the environment. 
BSL-1 is the lowest threat up to BSL-4, which are life-threatening diseases with no known cure, such as Ebola. Given the risks inherent with working with the raw materials, the agents, zoning is typically used to isolate labs from neighborhoods. BSL-2 and above are typically in zoned industrial and commercial use. Considerations need to be given to lab workers as well as the community and the environment in the, in the events of accidents, disaster, or building failure. This should be a key component of the environmental impact review process. This is important, particularly important if proposed developments are in proximity to neighborhoods or delicate bay ecosystems and where risk of disruption from sea level and groundwater rise is high. A good rule of thumb for these areas would be to outright prohibit, outright prohibit BSL-3 and 4. When evaluating a site, four considerations should be made. Seismicity, flooding, such as sea level rise, groundwater rise, and storm levels. Um, community, such as if it's near neighborhoods, transit hubs, shopping malls, and the environment, including waterways, areas under tidal influence, and sensitive habitats. Authorities should require applicants to include the following plans and documentation as part of the project requirements. The proposed biosafety levels, a biological risk assessment, the range of pathogens and agents used at the site, and the emergency protocols for both the labs and the surrounding environment and neighborhoods. Applicants should also provide a monitoring and verification program incorporating a rigorous and routine assessment for any potential air, water, or noise pollution and waste materials generated by the facility. Additionally, cities should adopt into their approval processes that any changes to the established biosafety level must first be approved by city council as it may trigger a new CEQA evaluation and it must be updated in the development agreement. And in the case of the speculative de development, require the developers include the allowed BSL in the initial entitlements and in the EIR. Afterwards, require each new tenant or owner provide all BSL documentation before a lease or purchase is approved. <laughs> and that's about three minutes. I hope that wasn't too quick. No, we got it. Thank you very much. Great. And then we have one last attendee. Uh, it's a phone number, 831, um, and then the rest of the number. So. Uh, well, huh, okay, I'm not getting the option to have this person as a panelist. Good evening, commissioners. Ah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for hearing me tonight. My name is Brian Shields, and I'm a field representative from Carpenters Local 217, covering San Mateo County. Uh, I wanted to take this time, as Anthony LeVice had spoke on earlier, to just talk about the need for labor standards, uh, labor standards that will lead your residents into better paying jobs, be able to be there for their kids, be able to show up financially uh, with health care, uh, prevailing wage, and apprenticeship, right? Without a way forward through apprenticeship, uh, most of these tradesmen are left in the dust. So the accountability of having uh, having labor standards in Burlingame will keep developers and contractors, uh, it'll keep them honest. It'll keep them, uh, it'll, it'll provide good paying jobs for, for your community. So um, that's all I have to say and thank you for your, thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have anyone else, Kevin? Uh, let's see, we have Gita Dev. Gita Dev is being brought in as a panelist. And uh, Ms. Dev, you have the floor. Hello, this is Gita. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Sorry for the technical hitch. Um, Steve Goodale, who spoke before me from the Sierra Club, gave a very quick overview about the different levels of biosafety for the different types of labs that are envisioned in Burlingame and in other cities. The reason that the Sierra Club is bringing this up 
is because biotech life sciences is blossoming all over the Bay, uh, all over our peninsula. And one of the things we realize is that while labs are very tightly restricted in terms of very tightly uh, governed in terms of their safety for workers, there really is not a good mechanism for the safety of the environment or the neighborhood. So I would like to request that this item be agendized for a future meeting because Burlingame is hope, hoping to go in big time for biotech and life sciences, right? So we should know that there's a certain amount of transparency in what developers are planning to do when they build speculative buildings or not speculative buildings as to what level of safety we need to plan for, for the environment and for the neighborhood. So I would ask that this item be agendized. And this is a very, I feel this is a very important issue for the whole of the Bayfront and the whole of the industrial area as we're rezoning it in Burlingame. That's our request. We are happy to provide a lot of information and research background so that when uh, the planning commission, when staff, when the council makes decisions on biotech, that we do it with the knowledge of what we need, what we need to do as a community in order to make sure that the environment and the residents are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other hands, Kevin? I do not see any more hands. And of the emails we've received, they are all for items on the agenda. So we will not be reading those yet. Okay. Then we'll move on to study items of which there are none. So we'll then go to consent calendar, which we have nothing on the agenda, which brings us to our regular action items. Uh, we have one regular action item, just uh, hors d'oeuvre for tonight's main course. Uh, it's uh, item 8A, 2313 Ray Drive. If you are the applicant or the applicant's representative, please raise your hand so that we may be prepared for you to speak at the appropriate time. If possible, we ask that you also turn on your video at that time. Were any commissioners not able to visit the project site or do any commissioners wish to note any ex parte communications regarding this project? All right. Let the record note that all commissioners present have visited the project site. Can we have a staff report, please? Uh, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is an application for 2313 Raid Drive for design review and a hillside area construction permit for a first and second story addition to an existing single unit dwelling, zoned R1. Um, the subject property is an interior lot. Uh, contains a one-story single unit dwelling and an attached garage. The lot's relatively flat until the rear third of the property where it has about a 20 foot difference in slope down to Mills Creek. The applicant is proposing an addition to the main living level at the rear and would also convert the crawl space to living space and add out at the lower floor as well for a two-story addition at the rear of the house. The proposed floor area would be 2,940 square feet, where 4,794 square feet is the maximum allowed. The subject property is located within the hillside overlay zone. This area does pervert, uh, preserve distant views for development in this area, primarily from the indoor living spaces. The existing house contains three bedrooms and the number of bedrooms would not change with the proposed project. The existing um, attached garage provides one covered parking space. It is considered non-conforming in length, but because there's no change to the number of bedrooms, the non-conformity can remain and is not required to comply with current code. Uh, one uncovered space is also provided in the driveway. This application before you this evening is for design review and a hillside area construction permit. The project first was before the Planning Commission on August 8th. At that time, the commission had um, some comments and suggestions, and the applicant has submitted a response letter and revised plan, state stamped August 11th. 
uh, planning staff has provided for you in your staff report suggested findings for design review, as well as suggested findings for the hillside area construction permit, as well as 12 recommended conditions of approval. Um, that concludes my presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Catherine. Are there any questions of staff? No, then I'm gonna open the public hearing with the applicant, please come forward and say your name and anything else you would like to add to your project. We're, um, Michelle McKenna, are you the applicant or Jeff Gard? Are you the architect? Ronan and I are the homeowners. Jeff is the applicant and architect. Okay. Would anyone like, would either of you like to uh, make a comment or add anything? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I had a technical issue on my end. Um, I think the staff report covers most of the issues. We were asked to revise the railing to provide a horizontal pattern to the pickets rather than a vertical. Uh, for the Juliet balcony. Um, so we presented renderings that show both options uh, for your input. Uh, one thing I was asked to bring up by the planning department is that uh, a tree very similar to the one shown in the renderings, uh, which we've incorporated, which we wrapped the deck around, uh, fell recently into the, from the neighboring property into the creek area. An arborist has come out and inspected the trees on our uh, parcel and did recommend the immediate removal of that tree. Unfortunately, uh, the tree that's closest to the house in the uh, renderings. So it, it sounds like if the arborist's request for removal is approved, that will tree will no longer be there before we start construction. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions of the applicant? Uh, Commissioner Foff? Um, yes, I'll, well, I'll start with that comment. Um, so is it, do you think that the two trees fell because of, I don't know, the grade or something like that, just a coincidence? And if, if obviously, if it's going to come out, do you have something in mind to take its place? Um, and second, I did want to ask you, um, we had inquired uh, I think I had maybe another person about um, the this. Um, well, it's sort of an insert in between various windows, and I on this is on page, well, it's in a couple of pages, a two point two, and I think it's a two point. Or it might have been on the side. Um, yeah, and so I noticed you did say on the back of the house that it was a steel plate spandrel, but you didn't call out the same space. Well, I thought it was the same space in between the windows on the little um, uh, window um, box area. Is it also a? I can see it in the. I can see in your rendering. It looks nice. I'm just curious. Is this, is it the same metal piece, or what, what do you have in mind there? I'm I'm not. Are you asking about at below the Juliet balcony? Yes, but I'm I'm actually asking. You called that out as met, metal, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm asking about um, in that same page uh, on your metal on your yes. Thank you very much. Thank oh you. yeah, that, I'm sorry. That that's trim that's painted to match the window. Okay, very good. This that, wood trim. Yeah. Okay, I just. Oh, I, it makes much more sense in the rendering and I, I didn't have the rendering in my packet. So I now understand. Thank you. So really just about the tree. Are you planning on uh, something else or? I think to, this was, this is pretty recent information for us. So we haven't uh -huh. talked about it too much with the owner. Um, okay. One approach would be to, to just incorporate that area into the terrace that we're planning back there. And that would help us, um, we would basically backfill that portion and that might help with some of the haul off that would be required for the excavation. Um, 
but we do have room to plant trees elsewhere on the property because I know they do want privacy and shade, um, you know, in those areas. But but maybe a little bit further from the house might be provide that without um, losing any of the terrace space. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, are there any other questions of the applicant? Uh, I just had one question. Um, just for clarification, the tree that fell was on the neighbor's property. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it's okay. a it's a similar tree in age and size. So, okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? Were there were there any comments received through email or Zoom chat? Uh, no comment. Uh, no emails on this item. Okay. Um, I see no hands, so I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, do we have any comments? Uh, Commissioner Schmidt. Yeah, um, I like the project. I, I, the rendering is helpful. Um, I wish we could see it a little bit more of it because we need to get it in our packet. So it's hard to evaluate it on screen green for the 10 seconds it was up but um but i like the project anyway uh and i hope that you actually do find a way to incorporate another tree further down the hill uh because i think it'll provide some nice shade and help you know in that back area so uh i think it's a good project hey uh vice chair Fav. yeah i i'll second that i think it looks really nice and um yeah, it would would have been nice to have the renderings, but I, you know, for the for the couple of seconds, it it, it looks lovely. So good job, and I I would love to see a, a tree incorporated, another one somewhere in there. Thank you, Commissioner Say. Uh, yes, I too uh, wanted to say that I I like the design, like how it's um, you know it's not even discernible from the street. Um, all of the addition is towards the rear and is nicely tied into the rest of the house. And I also appreciate the renderings that were submitted. Um, and if there aren't any further comments, I would move that we approve this project for the staff report. I would second that. Okay, um, I got the motion by Commissioner Say, and the second was by, I didn't see who made this, uh, Commissioner Schmidt. All right, so we have a motion by Commissioner Say, second by Commissioner Schmidt. Any discussion on the motion? No, then can we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, yes, Commissioner Camarado? Aye. Commissioner Horan? Aye. Commissioner Lowenthal? Aye. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. Commissioner Say? Aye. Vice Chair Pfaff? Aye. And Chair Gall? Aye. So the motion passes 7000, however many zeros we need. And an, app, an action by the Planning Commission is appealable to the City Council within 10 days of the Planning Commission's action. If the Planning Commission's action has not been appealed or called up for review by the City Council by 5 p.m. on the 10th day, the action becomes final. In order to be effective, appeals must be in writing and must be accompanied accompanied by an appeal fee of $745, which includes noticing costs. Congratulations and good luck with your project. Um, that will bring us to agenda item nine, or uh, to, to a design review study. Design review item agenda 9A. If you're the applicant or the applicant's representative, please raise your hand so that we may be prepared for you to speak at the appropriate time. If possible, we ask that you also turn on your video at that time. Were any commissioners not able to visit the project site or do any commissioners wish to note any ex parte communication regarding this project? And again, this is uh, 1669 and 1699 Bayshore Highway and 810 and 821 Malcolm Road. Is anyone recusing or has anyone not um, visited the site today or previous to this meeting? No, then let the record note that all commissioners present have visited the project site. Can we have a staff report, please? Uh, yes, the uh, Planning Commission first reviewed this application for environmental scoping and design review study on January 24th of 2022. At that time, the Commission provided suggestions and comments regarding the project. Uh, meeting minutes have been pro uh, provided with the staff report to refresh the memories and also allow the two new commissioners to be brought up to speed uh, with this application. 
The environmental review is underway. And meanwhile, the applicant requested to return to the Planning Commission for a second study hearing to review the design changes. The applicant would like to receive comments so they could be reviewed before the completion of the environmental review and before the action hearing is scheduled. The applicant has prepared a presentation, so I won't go over the application itself. Uh, but before we hear from the applicant, please let me know if there are any questions of staff. Thank you, Kevin. Are there any questions of staff? I see Commissioner Horan has his hand up. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to note that I had an ex parte communication with Peter uh, Bonsoff where he led me through the design. Great. Any other questions of staff? I don't see any other hands, so I'm going to open the public hearing. Would the applicant please come forward and state your name and anything else you'd like to add about your project? Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Gall, uh, Vice Chair Paff. Uh, looks like uh, my lights went out one second. Some of the early activity of the REACH code going into force here. Um, so uh, we have this evening a uh, presentation for you, which I'm excited to show you. Uh, it's been a while since we last met in January, uh, but we've had an opportunity to take in consideration some of your feedback and incorporate it into our project. And with me this evening is a principal with Perkins and Will, Peter Fowl, and principal with SWA Landscape Architects, Renee. And so we'll present to you our project and we're looking, we're excited to present it to you this evening. Uh, so we have a quick agenda, which is our project vision. Uh, there's a few new faces on the commission. So we wanted to take an opportunity to share our project with them for the first time. And then talk about uh, our project site plan and architecture what has kind of been uh, enhanced since we last spoke, and then speak more thoroughly about our community benefits. Our vision is to build a purpose-built life science campus in Burlingame to attract world-class companies uh, in an industry that promotes life-extending and life-saving treatments. Uh, part of our project vision also is to create a new and robust community gathering space, a town square, if you will, uh, to help support a growing neighborhood. And we also want to envision the Bayshore Highway as a new uh, urban setting uh, where we have the opportunity for street trees and enacting the city's vision for Bayshore Highway. And with that, we'll promote mass transit access given proximity to the Millbrae BART train station, as well as safe pedestrian space within our project and safe pedestrian crosswalks to the Bay Trail and bicycle ridership. This neighborhood is quite flat. And so bicycle riders uh, actually get the opportunity to ride here safely. Uh, we also are encouraging the exceeding of regional sustainability standards with implementing the REACH code, uh, hence the lights going off in my office, and climate action plan. For those of you who are not familiar where our project is located, it's in the Innovation Industrial Neighborhood, uh, which actually has laboratory use already with Alexandria present. Um, we're on the west side of Bayshore Highway, so we're not actually on the bay or on wetlands. We're set inward. Um, we do have close proximity to the Bar Cal train station, which is the only intermodal hub in the entire network that allows both heavy rail and uh, uh, subway systems. So that can connect us to Antioch to Gilroy, and that's pretty unique for Burlingame. We also have proximity to the Bay Trail, uh, but we're not on it. We, there is a community uh, pathway that leads to our project, but no access point. We'll speak about that a little bit later. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Renee, who's gonna speak a little bit about his vision for our town square. Thank you, Peter. The town square concept is designed really with the pedestrian in mind. It's a flexible and multi-dimensional space that will accommodate intimate day-to-day -day meetings, special program events, be they big, medium, or small, or multiple programs at once. The lower plaza gives barrier-free access lobby to lobby from the parking structure or from the public round uh, walkways, which border the site. The upper plaza supports the food and beverage program and <clears throat> as well as breakout for the community rooms. Between upper and lower is a very important and significant third space which um, is a three-dimensional space, which is expressed as a series of terrace gardens 
and theater seating spaces, which help support both the streetscape and program use on both upper and lower plaza. We'll take a look at how these spaces work, work uh, functionally as we get into the renderings a little later. Thank you, Renee. We, we show here our site plan, which should be included within the plans of your staff report. Um, and what I wanted to point out uh, here are some of our uh, flood design protection measures. So everything shown in green is our uh, finished floor elevation, which is set at 13 feet above sea level rise. In addition, uh, the areas shown in blue are at current grade or slightly below the sea level uh, rise uh, criteria, but we have accommodated them with a flood wall protection system, which has been successfully deployed in the Eastern coast quite frequently with hurricanes. Uh, we don't envision having uh, major issues, but we don't know. And we have seen flooding in this neighborhood in the past. So we have developed a system that can be reused, not only for our product, but for our neighbors. And so hopefully we're pioneering a way for you know, our local resident uh, neighbors to see what we're doing and implement it themselves. In addition, because we only have one vision or one uh, uh, slide on the site plan this evening, I want to highlight the access points for the property. They're shown in the red circles. So we've directed all of the vehicle access for our project on the perimeter. And that's really meant to reinforce the pedestrian thing. So this slide does two things. It shows sea level rise as well as where the access points are for cars. And so here, uh, Renee, you can uh, help show the vision here of our streetscape. Um, so in addition to uh, the town square, uh, which we'll, we'll come back to, um, the perimeter of the site is really designed as both a resilient and an immersive landscape. It's very three-dimensional in terms of using not just native uh, drought tolerant and um, salt tolerant plant material, but it's layered in terms of having an upper canopy, a lower canopy, canopy and articulated ground plane. So the idea is that um, the landscape is really helping to support um, the issues that the building program is supporting with sea level rise, but it's also supporting the ground floor program, which is active on the ground floor, either at the breakout spaces, which we'll look at on the town square, or in important architectural moments like the building corners where the landscape gives views into uh, the, the action that's happening inside the building itself. And then I'll, I'll pass the microphone over to Peter Fowle from uh, Perkins and Will, who's a principal there. Yeah, and I, um, good evening, commissioners. Um, in this view, you also get a sense of the scale of the building has been reduced with its passing strategy, and then there's an articulation of the skin of the building that also makes it more human scale. Let's have the next slide. And one of the feedback we got during our last study session was to think about bird safety. So uh, we engaged H.T. Harvey and Associates, which is a noted uh, ornithologist and uh, we had them do research about bird flight patterns on the site and develop a uh, whole uh, bird frit patterning that's built into the skin of the building that's compliant with the city of San Francisco bird safe standards. And down in the left-hand corner of the page, you can see a little pattern of dots. That's actually what we'll deploy on the screen. It's developed based on the size of the bird and things like that. So. Um, at any rate, we, we have wrapped the building with uh, bird saving. And uh, moving forward, um, we just thought we'd share some of the tenanting plans. Uh, this is really meant to be a state-of-the-art life science building. It's a 60% 60, 60 lab to 40% office mix. Um, and it's multi-tenanted. So it can be up to four tenants per floor, which enables us to accommodate all kinds of emerging as well as established uh, businesses in the, in the area. Next slide. Uh, 
I'm going to hand so, it over to Renee to start on this. Yeah, here's a corner shot of uh, the town square. And what you can see is that uh, the building facades um, frame the, the uh, space beautifully. The landscape helps scale that uh, facade down to a pedestrian level on the, scout, on the ground plane uh, without becoming too, too trivial. Um, you know, in, in landscape architecture, there are these important principles of foreground, midground, and background. And in this particular project, these kind of squares, it's really the foreground and its relationship to the background that's the most important. Being able to be immersed in these three-dimensional landscapes as you're going through them, but seeing the spaces beyond. So the lower space connects to the upper space, uh, connects to the streetscape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've brought in a variety of warmer garden-like materials, um, wood, um, articulated paving that helps clarify circulation and entry into the lobby, as well as connecting um, lobby to lobby across the street. Um, in the center, you see uh, one of the terrace gardens with theater seating. Um, as you know, the space, both solar and wind, have been studied by um, the, uh, an expert group. And we give, you know, what's really key is that there's a variety of seating, different aspects, different orientations for different times of the year. But in the peak hours, both lunch and evening hours, we think um, the, the space will be well lit and lots of protection um, around the edges. So again, three-dimensional space, tightly connected. It's lower, mid, and upper garden. And the thing I would add to that is here you can get a sense of the active uses wrapping the lower floor. There's a specific expression to the more tra transparent base. So we wanted to bring on some of the, you know, the most qualified designers uh, to help in, you know, enact this vision, as well as some of the most qualified contractors. And we're, we've heard the earlier commentary, and so we're uh, committed to use union labor for this project. So just wanted to make sure we didn't avoid that moment. And part of the things that we wanted to bring forward to you tonight is our community benefits overview. And some of this is discussed in a short clip that I'd like to show you in a second to help uh, paint a story of what we're trying to achieve here. But the community benefits are broken into four pieces. The first one is a public plaza, which is meant to create a sense of place, uh, one where it may not exist today. And that's that new town square. And we have two uh, plazas, both for each building. And in comb combination, they can create a really unique setting. We also have access to our uh, interior amenities, which help support our project as well as the public realm. We're contemplating public art throughout the space, and we want to have some offsite infrastructure improvement to help uh, bolster the connectivity of the businesses to the west of us, the visitors to the hotels, um, as well as visitors on the bayfront, and then our project to those areas. And so our first benefit is the public plaza. And again, I mentioned uh, we had you know 6,400 square feet for one of the buildings, 5,700 square feet for the other. In combination with the uh, street, it's over 17,000 square feet of event space. And so we believe that we can work with the Chamber of Commerce and other local businesses to come up with a really unique venue. So some of the feedback we had in January about the plazas were concerns about the size, concerns about shading and wind, uh, concerns about the pedestrian interaction with truck traffic, and then elaborating on programming opportunities. And we feel that we've accommodated these by specifying the size of the plazas being each equaling the zoning criteria, but in combination being really something special like you would see at you know, Burlingame Avenue. Uh, we had concerns about the shading and prevailing winds, but we've studied those professionally and there was an exhibit that should have been included in your staff report about that, which we believe uh, illustrates that the plazas are gonna be delightful places that are protected from the wind and have abundant sunlight. We've located the truck and vehicle traffic to the perimeter of the property so that the plazas really have that opportunity for the public and for pedestrian access. And our programming, while a little bit to be determined, really creates an event space that can be for normal use as well as some special event space throughout the year. 
Here's a photo of what it would look like when finished. I'm gonna hurry up because I know I'm trying to keep to my time here. We also have some amenities on the inside that are publicly accessible, including a 4,000 square foot cafe. And we've located that cafe at the very corner of the project so that's most visible to the public realm. Inside the, the buildings, we also have a conference center, which will be reservable by the public through a building management system that in, has in both buildings, both a 100 person conference center, as well as a boardroom for more intimate settings. And we have the ability to uh, create breakout space, which was the, the primary concern about the amenities uh, in January. So we have breakout space both inside as well as outside now. Here's a view of that cafe with the transparency on the ground floor that we had talked about. In public art, we envision public art being really throughout the campus. Uh, we're most excited about the opportunity to create a large structural piece that could be in the center of the plaza. And this is just a, an idea that we've had. We also have it in the amenities, uh, as well as the public spaces on the interior. And something that we're really excited about is the opportunity to turn our parking structure into a mural. And so we haven't yet fully uh, figured this concept out, but we wanted to introduce it to you as something we're willing to do. And then lastly, connectivity. We wanna make sure that uh, the public can get access to our project as well as our project and our uh, business neighbors to the West can get access to the Bay Trail. Uh, in January, some of the uh, feedback that we received was regarding a mid-block crossing. We had presented two options. And we worked with city staff through some of the criteria of that. And because of the larger vision of the Bayshore Highway, the preference by city staff was to locate it at Malcolm. And so we've shown that in our plans. And so I have a very quick video that uh, hopefully won't take a lot of time. So. The idea is that our building is the same size as uh, what you already see on the Bayfront. And as we uh, introduce our building, we have the opportunity to have it shelter our plaza. And that plaza can be off of the Bayfront, but it's most accessible by the public that doesn't experience the park. And that plaza would be at Newtown Square, which we could program with a variety of ideas we have with FK. Uh, it's about exactly five kilometers from Meta's headquarters. We could also do a Bayfront uh, version of Burlingame Avenue Street Fair like we had last weekend. But we're trying to create that pedestrian scale here where there really isn't that opportunity. And then as the plaza interfaces with the ground floor, we really want to create that indoor outdoor experience that can work like. So we have this opportunity to have a well sense of wellness inside the building, as well as the opportunity for high-end finishes and to create a new cafe to you know, be a real amenity for the public. We've located that cafe next to our conference. So it could be you can sit inside or you can sit outside. And the idea is that the permanent seating uh, that people can do it. Around. And so this is really our vision for the community benefits and public builds on itself over time. Uh, and we hopefully uh, see that you share that vision with us. So with that, you've made it to the finish line uh, and you know, I appreciate your uh, patience with me as we've gone through all these things. So that's our presentation for you this evening. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, does anyone have questions for the applicant? Uh, Commissioner, Vice Chair Foth. Um, hi there, and thank you very much for your very informative presentation. Um, I just want, I don't know if you can answer this for me, but maybe I'm hoping. What is the typical arrangement um, for uh, community spaces that you've perhaps done in the past or, or are they 
exorbitantly expensive? How are they priced? Do you have any idea? Or you just hand it to a management company and they figure out something? Um, are you, uh, if you Rental, would, um, like, uh, like programming or? No, I mean, um, I, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood this. So I thought these would be available to the public and then their market rate is kind of what you're saying. I mean, it's offered as an amenity, but it's it's basically a, a basic rental for an event. And that that's my question. How What is the arrangement with the, I guess, well, I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say there's a nonprofit who would like to use one of your spaces? What um, do you know? How that works? Uh, how the rentals are? Are they just simply market rate? What What is the arrangement? Sure. sure. Thank you for the question. Um, so, for the exterior spaces, there would be uh, no rental. Obviously, we that is um, just plaza space for people to enjoy. We would want to coordinate efforts, though, if there was an idea to shut them down with a special street permit, of course. Uh, we've engaged with the um, Chamber of Commerce to talk about ideas. Um, and so we'll continue that dialogue and hopefully come back here for that. For the interior spaces, uh, our vision is the um, conference center would not have a fee associated with it, as long as it's not abused. Uh, so the idea is that we would have the opportunity through a first come first serve reservation system. Um, and we would have an online ability to have individuals you know, access that. Very nice, thank you. Um, and finally, uh, well, uh, the artwork that you envision in there, um, and this is just a comment, um, or uh, we're not supposed to ask. We're not supposed to have comments. We're supposed to ask questions. Do you uh, envision possibly uh, local, um, at least peninsula artists, um, having perhaps a priority for the space that you um, have available? Um, you, not only your um, large piece that you're talking about that you showed in pink, but the murals that you envision on the parking garage, which would be way cool. Um, do you, I, th I think we, we want to have a regional competition of sorts. Um, we're, we're not proposing that we would bring a, a, a Banksy or somebody you know, of that type of stature, um, but we would have the opportunity to, to source anybody that was uh, available. Okay. And then finally, um, there are, uh, well, I'm gonna save this one for a little later No, Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Lowenthal. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Very informative um, and uh, very nice to see. I I'm very interested in the offsite infrastructure improvements that you're doing and notably, uh, the access to the Bay Trail. I think that's fantastic. I'm wondering, have you investigated any vehicle of some sort of investing back into the Bay Trail itself? Um, you're you're going to be putting quite a few people being able to go in and out of this structure to the Bay Trail. And I'm just wondering if you investigated or looked into any sort of uh, investment into the Bay Trail. Uh, I, we, I guess is your question, an investment in the Bay Trail as in like a contribution to improving it, I guess. Could you elaborate? Yeah, the, Bay, the Bay Trail is maintained by you know nonprofit organizations, and I certainly appreciate the access point. But you're going to be putting a lot more population onto the Bay Trail, which is very dear to the city of, of Burlingame and our residents. So I'm just wondering if there's any sort of investment vehicle or any sort of um, information that you've looked at as far as, like I said, investing in the Bay Trail itself. Um, that, I, that's my question. Yeah. Understood. I, the the word vehicle threw me for a loop. Apologies. Um, <laughs> But let me uh, let me get back to you on that. It's a great suggestion and not something that I've you know, fully digested for this meeting, if that's OK. No problem. Uh, Chair Gall, you are muted. Yep. Yeah. Commissioner Horan. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. That was a great presentation. 
Just three questions, um, just following up on the minutes from the first uh, review of this project regarding the cafe for a development of this size. Just wondering why you didn't choose to put in a full restaurant with a with a kitchen. That's a, that's a great, good point. Um, we, we've we studied that uh, and Black Iron restaurants have quite a few uh, considerations around uh, exhaust and uh, those types of uh, you know, for lack of a better word, smells and considerations. And so we, um, including trash. Uh, so we wanted to propose a cafe that was more flexible uh, from that standpoint and had the opportunity to have offsite food prep uh, that could then be brought to the property, which would help make it more grab and go centric. And that was really our orientation around it. Thanks. Could you highlight uh, any green aspects of the project, solar or other kind of environmental uh, considerations? Sure. Uh, so we will be going for a full uh, all electric building. So we'll be going for the full reach code. We're not seeking a variance. Um, we are also uh, going for lead gold, uh, which is one of the uh, sustainability measures that we're focused on. Uh, we've met the EV requirements, but we're trying to uh, think through ways to um, increase the number of uh, high free, high capacity chargers within our garage. And that's something that we'd wanna introduce to the city um, because as an EV, you know, less or lease person myself, you know, I, I do find that the level two chargers take a while. And so perhaps there's strategies there that we can work on. Uh, so those are the things that we've contemplated. Um, solar has been studied for the project. It's hard to locate it on top of the garage uh, for a couple of different reasons. Namely, um, it's just a very tall you know, element that would be going front. So it just exas makes it larger. And then separately, um, the uh, on top of the roof is an opportunity of our buildings. We do have solar there but we also have mechanical systems that we need to work through. So the, the roof solar is something that we do have. It's just not as large as you would see as a solar farm out in Nevada or something like that. Sure. And then lastly, maybe just an elevator speech on uh, why the special permit for the height exemption. Uh, I, staff might be able to comment on that uh, more eloquently than I, um, but uh, uh, let me know uh, Director Gardner, if you'd like me to take that one. Uh, certainly. Uh, the way the zoning is written, the um, the taller buildings do require a special permit. So it's kind of built into the zoning. And what the special permit allows is um, there are additional findings that need to be made, particularly on the design. So um, an applicant can request a taller building, but it does come with an obligation. They They need to kind of make a case for it. And then the commission needs to be able to make a finding that um, the height of the building is acceptable for all, all the various reasons. Thanks. Yeah, my question might not have been clear. So what is the case that you're making for that? Uh, so uh, our, our building is going to be taller than the minimum uh, size. And with that is uh, trying to study what a successful life science building needs. And um, life science buildings from our vantage, as well as King Street, who's our partner on this project, a very successful um, operator of life science real estate. Uh, it's, they don't necessarily need to be uh, very large structures, but they do need to be uh, tall enough as you know, floor to floor ceiling heights to accommodate HVAC equipment. And so while you don't get a, a lot of stories involved, so it's not a 10 story building, it's a six and seven story building, uh, those are large stories. And so they end up being 16 feet floor to floor. Uh, plus you have a larger ground floor lobby and then you add on mechanical systems and sea level rise that stacks up pretty quickly. And so that's why we're seeking the special permit. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Say. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much. It was just a really a nice presentation. And, um, um, visually um, stunning and um, a lot of thought put, um, put to your um, design. So appreciate that. I just have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, 
kind of falling back on the uh, what um, Vice Chair Foff was bringing up about the community spaces, um, just to understand. I think you were saying that there would be, there's no intention of charging any fees for the rental of those spaces for various programs, whether nonprofit or otherwise. Is that correct? That's correct. Good. So. Um, that's wonderful. Um, and then I was wondering if there was any thought about um, providing food and beverage service for any of the programs that may be um, carried out in those community spaces for you know conferences or you know full day events, um, or is the intention really to kind of break out and go to the cafe um, and utilize a cafe kind of as a separate um, service or um, purchase? <laughs> So our, our, I guess maybe it would be a case by case basis if, if that's you know, more appropriate. If it's, you know, um, it, it would be hard to answer that question as a universal answer, I guess is the best way I could state it. We, we would have a cafe that'd be open for the conference center. Uh, so if there was the opportunity that individuals wanted to have food and beverage as part of their conference or their conference scene, uh, that's available to them and it would be a purchase. But if it was, you know, something that was, you know, very specialized for a nonprofit, I mean, I think we would be open to suggestions there. Okay, great. Uh, I think, I mean, there's just uh, so much opportunity there. So it's just kind of curious how this might be programmed out. Um, so thank you. And then um, my second question was around, um, it maybe it was just a terminology thing, but I, I saw on A10-08, which is Penthouse South, um, that it says there's a future roof terrace um, on that South side. And I wasn't sure, I think that's the only one I see noted as future. Um, and I don't know if that was intended to be future or um, or yes. That, that, that might've been a, a, a typo, to be honest. So we, we deliberately designed the buildings to receive uh, you know, outdoor space and we've engineered them to have a paver system that's locked down for wind. Um, something that is you know very common in the Bay Area is the, the desire for outdoor space. Mm -hmm. And so while we've given away the outdoor space on the ground floor, what we're trying to do is create private space for tenants. And if we have a user that wants to use a roof deck, then we've engineered one uh, that is accommodated in a specific location, but we don't have the exact design finalized yet. Okay, wonderful. I just wasn't sure if that was something potentially built in in the future um, or or not. So that totally makes sense. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands. So I have a few questions. Uh, first off, I I think that maybe it was given to us before, but do you know the the building height in relation to the Marriott across the street? The southern building, so there's two buildings and a parking structure. The southern building um, I have actually, just look at my notes very quickly. I believe we are at 140 feet tall, 145 feet tall. The Marriott is 162. And then the Southern building is around 160, so slightly less. The Southern building has one extra story than the North building and the parking structure is uh, 90 feet tall. Right, okay, okay, that's great, thank you. Um, so then I have a few questions about, you know, these food amenities. Do you have um, a cafe or a restaurant in the buildings that's gonna be exclusive to the tenants or the employees of the, of the employees of the tenant, you know, that would not be accessible to the public? We, we are not uh, forecasting that at this time, but but we also are a speculative building. So there could be a tenant that comes along that has some sort of kitchen component, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not expecting that. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of curious because I'm thinking, you know, the people are going to be there, they're going to want to go out and have lunch. And if it was available nearby, including this ground floor cafe, which I, I, I think that the project is, is, is really nicely done, but I'm wondering about a little bit more if you've got all these employees and they're going to be looking for a place to go to lunch. Because I said in previous comments, um, you know, the places that are out there are packed at lunchtime. So I don't think you can go wrong by having a little bit more 
but that's just a, more of a comment, I guess, than a question. Um, okay, then the, I know that you have this, this idea of the food trucks, which I think is great. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, and I don't know how that's all scheduled. Would that be daily that you would have food trucks there or, or how's that gonna work? I think we have a placeholder for them and we wanted to make sure that we had the ability to accommodate uh, food trucks. You know, uh, we, don't, we have not yet figured out the total operational component of food trucks or you know, that type of programming but we wanna make sure that our plans accommodated it so that we could locate them in a place that staff felt was appropriate. And we've looked at whether that would be in front of the plazas directly or not, um, but we want that was not appropriate um, for uh, emergency vehicles. And so we made sure that we uh, held out street parking as you see, you know, leading up to okay. Bayshore Highway. So that's what we placed them. So okay. a little roundabout I mean, answer there. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, I, you know, I, I just think it's a, it's a really good way to keep the street alive and keep people out there. I mean, the public benefit is this, is this plaza. So, and I, and I, I don't envision it just for the, you know, the, the tenants of the building. I, I see it for the hotel guests and I, I, believe me, I've been out there at lunchtime, you know, Berlin game heating has been one of my subcontractors. I, 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 you know, you you get out there and you kind of go, yeah, I think I might just have lunch here. And so it'd be nice to have a place, which leads me to my next question. I think I saw that the cafe is going to be open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, do you, is that seven days a week? That, that was meant to be open on the weekends. That meant to be work days to start. And then as the building fills up and the neighborhood builds out, we would envision that opening up further. Okay. All right. Um, and then my last question is public parking. Do you provide any public parking? Not, not in the parking structure. Um, we do have the street parking that we you know, mentioned, but that's not ours to give. Um, we have a surface parking that's not reserved. But the, the concept of the parking structure is to be tenants. Is there, is there an opportunity for some public parking? I think in, we that, could, in the parking structure? I, I think we could explore that. I, I, I think it would be important because, um, you know, there's been some comment about the parking in the area already on the street. And anything would be helpful. I mean, we'd encourage people to ride their bikes or walk out there, but if you could find some place for some public parking, I think that it would really help this project and it help that public element, um, you know, and the public benefit that, that it seems to be kind of a key element of this project. Understood, thank you. And those are all the questions that I have. Um, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on this item or were any comments received through email or Zoom chat? Uh, so there are two members of the public with hands up, and then we have a, a couple of emails. Um, I do want to also clarify um, just on one item that came up. Uh, the hotels, uh, I, I know we all get the hotels mixed up. Um, the, the hotel that's 162 feet is the Hilton, um, which has had, had different names over time, but um, that is currently the, the tallest building. And the Marriott across the street is uh, 108 feet. Um, but I, I know it's uh, hard to keep all these buildings straight. So I just wanted to um, provide a little clarification on that. Okay, um, thank you. With that, I see uh, Peter Gev and Peter Camarado have hands up. Uh, we will bring in Hita Dev first. Give just a moment for the technology to catch up with us here. Good evening. Am I live? You are live. Thank you, Director Gardner. Uh, commissioners, uh, Planning Commission, I really appreciate the uh, your questions and um, I think this is an extremely interesting project so I compliment the team on the thoughtfulness that has been that has gone into this project I do have a few questions um, similar to what the commission was asking um, one of the questions relates to lighting 
I see that H.G. Harvey has been involved in the skin of the building and that it will be some, somewhat fritted glass. For bird safe design, fritted glass is one of the options. Um, less glass is really the best option so that the birds can actually see the building. They don't see a reflection. Even with the fritted glass at this location, they will tend to see uh, the reflections very clearly. So given that, I'm wondering, is there anything more that you can do uh, in terms of trying to make it less of a trans transparent reflective box? So that's one question. The other is lighting. At night, this building is in fact taller in, than the uh, Marriott that it's behind and it's a lot bigger. So um, lighting at night is gonna be really important. There is a way uh, to turn the lights off after a certain time so that the glare onto the bay at night is not um, a big issue. It's not like a hotel room where there are hotels where there are just windows. This is obviously just a huge sheet of transparent glass box. So if we can consider something about the lighting, turning the lights down in the evening, turning them off at night and during um, the times when there is migration of birds to actually make sure that the lights are turned off at a certain time at night, that would really help. Uh, the other thing is the, I noticed that there's a cafe and this is a life sciences building with a lot of labs in it. I think um, based on the biosafety level presentation that was given earlier, I wonder if we can include in the entitlements what levels of biosafety will be accommodated in this building. We note that if you go into biosafety two, it's very infectious diseases like HIV and flu and so forth. But if you go to BSL three, these are air, air transported through the air, they're airborne diseases, aerosol diseases like plague, tuberculosis, anthrax, COVID, they're all BSL-3, so it would be really good if the entitlements include this in the interest of transparency. So I was wondering if that could be included too, particularly since we're planning on having the public in the cafe right there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next in attendees. We have someone else, Kevin? Yes, uh, we have a hand up for Peter Camarado. We will promote him to panelist. Hello, this is Peter Joseph. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so overall, I think this is a really, really cool project over for the Bay Shore. Um, as I was listening and looked at the plans, I just had a couple of questions and comments. One of them being the retail space. Um, it's been talked about that that space would kind of go to activate the for the public. Um, but with only 6,000 square feet of that retail, or not retail space, sorry, the, well, it's going to be a, um, a little cafe. But of that retail space, as it shows in the plans, that's basically three Starbucks. Um, if, assuming Starbucks are about 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. So I don't know how much activation that would necessarily do with the public. And along with that is just making sure that that space is open on the weekends for the bikers and the families that do decide to walk over there near the Bay Shore. Um, another comment that I had was on the depth of the loading bay and getting the drivers in and out of the loading docks more efficiently. Um, it looked a little bit short in the way they were backing up on the last few pages of the plans. I just wanted to throw that out. And then the whole idea of where the trucks are coming from. Um, and this may be a question more for uh, city council or someone in the city, but with how many, with the two lane highway from Broadway and even out of Millbrae Ave coming in um, with the trucks, that's gonna create a lot of extra traffic. So just thinking about how the infrastructure should be improved in that area to really focus on providing a more efficient way in and out, especially with all the demand or there's supply coming online with the office space over on the Bayshore. 
Um, I like the idea of the bike racks. I know that the minimum was pretty low. And if we're really trying to activate this space, maybe add another bike rack. Um, and then the last thing is, I know that we did talk about activating this for the public, but an overall comment about limiting access of the public to, from the office and industrial space. And this is probably more of a security issue and what that necessarily looks like. And I know this wouldn't go through entitlements, but thinking about um, is there going to be full-time staff there to kind of keep that place safe, not only for the community, but keep them out of the office and industrial park and not allow them to wander into places that they shouldn't be. Um, I think overall, it's a, it's a really great project. I'm happy that we have life science and other bigger companies coming into Burlingame. I think that's good for, for all of us in the community in general. Um, just want to make sure that some of these little small things are thought about. Well, thank you. Do we have any more public comments or emails? Uh, there are two emails. Um, I will start with the first one. It is signed Doug Bojak. Uh, he says, Dear Planning Commission staff, please provide the following comment for design review study item 9A, 1669-1699 Bayshore Highway. I commend the commission on focusing on the Bay Trail connection, increased wayfinding to and from the Bay Trail, and the opportunity for a mural to enliven the street level facade during its previous discussions of this project. I also agree that a publicly accessible conference room at the base of a commercial office building is not likely to produce much of a community benefit and want to point out that an essentially corporate cafe is unlikely to provide much of a community benefit outside of the eventual tenants employees, nor is a proposed community plaza likely to act as much more than a breezeway connecting the parking garage with the north panel. In addition to these project features, I urge the city to commit to developer uh, commit the developer to funding offsite streetscape improvements through code section 25.12.040C5 to help turn Bayshore Highway into a complete street. Addressing ac active transportation connectivity is especially important since the development is a six minute bicycle ride from the Millbury BART and future high speed rail station. I would also like to see a much greater number of secure bicycle parking spaces included as a community benefit up from the roughly 50 proposed, as well as a general reduction from the nearly 1,000 proposed car storage spots. In total, these community benefits would advance the City Council's transportation and sustainability priorities and would help the Emerging Life Sciences Development Cluster in the area prioritize walking and bicycling around the eventual campus groupings. Uh, thank you, Doug Bojak. And then there is one more. Um, this one is signed Ethan Rebellos. Hi, I want to let you know that I'm excited about the new development along Bayshore Highway. I'm excited about the public plaza, the public art, and the publicly accessible ground floor amenities. I'm particularly enthusiastic about the proposed cafe or bistro, although I strongly encourage that we consider more of a full service restaurant and bar on the site. Unfortunately, several excellent restaurants and bars in the area will be displaced by other construction projects throughout Burlingame. I want to first, I want to point my comments to community benefits CB6. First, I would like to see more than a crosswalk. I would like to see pedestrian scale lighting and wide sidewalks along Bayshore, flashing beacons at the crosswalk, and for the developer to submit a proposed plan to encourage bicycles with protected bicycle facilities. Finally, I strongly encourage a method for enhanced shuttle service between the facility, the Caltrain stations, Broadway, and Burlingame Avenue. And that is signed. Thank you, Ethan Rebellos. Thank you. Uh, I do not see any more emails. Those were the two that we have on this item. Okay, great. Um, then I'm going to close the public hearing. And commissioners, do we have any comments or discussion on the project? Uh, let's see, uh, Commissioner Schmidt. Yeah, um, I wanted to thank the team for doing uh, quite a bit of work since the last time we saw this. Um, when I saw it last, uh, there was quite a few things that I was, you know, concerned about, and I think that you guys heard us and came back with a really, really, I think, successful presentation of the information and addressing many of our concerns. Um, you know, I was 
particularly concerned with the civil and how the street goes down because uh, it seems a little steep now, but I think looking at the civil drawings and how you've attacked that uh, crosswalk between the two buildings, I think it's actually going to work well. Uh, so I'm happy that that was uh, looked at and, and considered. I think that the cafe concept without having a full restaurant there is actually a good idea. Uh, there's quite a few ways that you can bring food in without actually having all the kitchen equipment and serving very uh, full meals and being able to handle uh, uh, a company like, you know, all the people that are there. Um, I've been in many large uh, buildings where we've built in kitchens and cafes and they're difficult to run. Uh, it's a lot of added uh, stress on to the building people. And I think that by having it uh, offsite and being able to bring it in, you'll still be able to manage a good opportunity. And I also think that with, in combination with the food trucks, you'll have an opportunity to do more than just, you know, one kind of food or, or really just cafe food. So I think, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, I think that the parking, um, you know, they, they, it was mentioned earlier that parking on the street was difficult and we are looking to take a few more of those public spaces away, it looks like. Um, I think that more than dedicating, it's just looking at the programming such that if you're not, you know, if your parking isn't fully utilized by the tenants, that you have an opportunity to allow for public parking to happen programmatically and not then say that you can't because of the way it's designed. So it's just a look. Um, but I think that the, I think it's a great looking project, uh, looking forward to it and, and would like to see it uh, move forward. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Camarado. Yeah, I agree with Commissioner Schmidt. I think the project is a nice project. Um, I think there are a little things that can be tweaked. Um, one of the things that I'd like to bring up to possibly staff as well is the lighting. Um, I think that, uh, and I don't know, Kevin, if um, staff has looked at this, but it would be nice to kind of have a, um, maybe a lighting plan for the Bayside so we can keep lighting kind of all similar throughout with all these new projects that are coming um, to the Bayfront. So pedestrian lighting, especially, um, and for all these new projects that they kind of look, they don't have to look the same, but that they're similar and that we can all feel really safe out there um, when we're walking around, especially on the Bay Trail at night. Um, you know, some of these European countries have some beautiful lights so that people are walking on the on the shores and um, just take a look at the lighting, uh, um, what what we need out there as as a city, um, which will then activate it for everyone involved. Um, I um, also am just very cautious about the traffic. I think we're going to see a lot more traffic, especially with all these new projects. And um, I'd like to see some safe, safety, more safety issues with the pedestrians and these crosswalks. So if we could have staff um, really look at the safety issues with lights and flashing lights. And so uh, cars know when to stop um, and for bikes as well. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Fox. Yeah, I, I agree with my fellow commissioners um, and I do want to uh, thank you for, I, I think you did a stellar job. Uh, it looks like you really looked at everything again and um, I, I think it's definitely going in the right direction. I, I do, I'm a little, out, I'm sort of out of sorts with the, co the public comments regarding um, well, it's not my expertise, and I don't know if it's anyone's expertise who's sitting there um, regarding the the bird issue as well as the um, the bio hazards. And I feel like I um, I don't know if we should just like kind of let it go. I just I I'm not really sure how this is supposed to work. I guess it will depend on the tenant, but I I think um, that some of these issues they are they are really quite important. I haven't honestly really thought about the uh, the biohazard issues, um, BS whatever 
I'm sorry, BS2 and BS, whatever the woman has mentioned, one and two, the, the two speakers. Um, I do, I do think, I, I don't know if that's our place or council to direct, but I, I think it's important. I do want to acknowledge that as well as the complete street comments by the recent speaker and agree that um, we definitely need to, to pay attention there because people just get zipping along. And um, I, I think some uh, more attention to that, the area generally would be really, really great with the development. I do have one specific comment. It's, a, it's not a uh, must do, but it is a it is an ask um, on your tree assessment. Uh, and by the way, I think you did an absolutely gorgeous landscape job. It's many layered. It's got a, a lot of variation um, in type and um, scale. It's beautiful, um, and you've got some really nice specimen trees. However, um, on your tree removal plan, there are um, five. Mexican palm palms that were fan palms that were rated as high and in very good condition. And those happen to be trees that your, your landscaper probably knows are very um, readily um, transplanted and you don't plan to have those on your site. I understand that though. I have recently seen them planted all over San Francisco and Mission Bay. Um, developments, just the same tree, and it looks really cool, very similar. But um, since those are on the sidewalk, it would be really nice if you would offer them to um, uh, palm companies or other developers. I remember as an aside, um, a, a number of years ago, there was some, I believe it, it was a development in Burlingame, might have been the Hyatt, I can't remember. And there were many of these same palms and many dozens. And they were actually offered up and given to Milbrae. And Milbrae, I think that's their street tree now. They have beautiful Mexican fan palms that came from elsewhere. And um, they're, they take forever to grow to that height. And these are in good condition. So it's just a, a comment. It would be really nice since they're accessible and they're on the sidewalk to offer them uh, up to a company or sell them, whatever it is. Just my comment, but good job. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Lowenthal. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gall. I, I full heartedly agree with my, my fellow commissioners. I think it's a fantastic project, looks really nice. Presentation was very thoughtful, uh, very helpful to understand the vision. Um, I also think it fits very well in that area. Uh, this, the, the scale and the sizing, I think, fits within the other buildings there. And I think it'll be a very attractive uh, set of buildings when people are flying into the bay and of course on the bay trail. Um, I also like the community improvements they're doing. I do agree that a 4,000 square foot cafe really doesn't do much for me. Um, it'd be nice if they could do more. Um, I don't quite understand the ventilation and, and things like that that they were complaining about, because as we know, a biotech building has more ventilation than a standard building. So I, it doesn't quite register of, of that request um, or that, that uh, uh, you know, um, description. So it'd be nice to see a little bit more there, um, especially when you have such a, a vast community plaza planned. It's really all just going to be maintained by food trucks, I suppose, which there's no way we could ever require food trucks to come. Maybe we could ask for some sort of permit provision that they're going to guarantee certain permit. I, I don't know how that would work, but how, how are we ever going to require that food trucks actually go there? Um, I am really concerned about the Bay Trail. You know, we are going to be looking at a lot of life science along the Bay Trail uh, to two tonight and uh, many more to come. And you're, you're talking about a, a significant population influx on the Bay Trail, especially when we're adding pedestrian crossings, bike racks, things like that. The Bay Trail is going to get a lot of work. And um, I don't know the financial, uh, you know, the financial well-being of the Bay Trail project and those nonprofits, but I do feel like we should obligate some of these developers to do more than just build a crosswalk. I feel like the Bay Trail needs, uh, it, you know, needs uh, improvements. Uh, certainly, the project we're going to be looking at after this is adding to the Bay Trail, but again, they don't have any proposal to actually add to the Bay Trail project in any sort of fiscal way. And I don't know how, how you do that. And I'm um, certainly open to ideas there. But that's really where my biggest concern is, is on the Bay Trail itself and, and, and those types of community uh, improvements. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Say. Thank you. Uh, yes, I too also confer with all my fellow commissioners, all the wonderful collection of comments that um, everyone has brought to the table here. Um, I too want to commend the, the team on a wonderful design that's been very uh, carefully and thoughtfully um, considered uh, of our comments from our last go around. Um, the development of the design has an improved greatly and um, and I, I think it's there's a lot of care to it. I, I really do like the um, the the street level kind of podium level um, and how it separates itself from the upper levels of the buildings um, and does create that pedestrian scale um, for those who will be uh, utilizing the, the public plaza um, and the spaces around. Um, so I think that that's very nicely achieved. Uh, very beautiful landscape design. I also appreciate the attention to um, one of our comments from the last meeting about the location of the ADA ramp and um, and how you know that was in a potentially um, a dangerous position for um, those who are not ADA um, users, um, skateboarders and others. So I um, appreciate um, the attention that you put to that and re relocating um, the location of the ramp. Um, I, I do have um, some concerns about parking, um, public access parking for, especially with a community space that can accommodate um, up to 100 people, I believe it is, or um, in multiple groups and adding up to 100. And if, if one was to rent or use these spaces uh, for a community event or conference, um, and they are not regular um, employees in these buildings, where would all these people park? Um, they certainly are not going to all ride their bicycles here. Some may, but um, we'd have to think through the, the program carefully if, if this is really going to be a successful community space. So I think that parking attention um, needs to be addressed. Um, and I too am questioning why we can't have um, one or more kitchens um, and or restaurant type spaces here or a variety of cafes and, um, and other kind of food and beverage type um, outlets to support uh, which hopefully is a, a very burgeoning uh, public plaza and give people a variety um, of foods and types of um, treats to enjoy and, and come and use the space. Um, I don't feel confident that we can rely on a food truck system to make this happen. So something that's thought through now um, and, and built into the space, I think would make this a much more successful program. But um, otherwise, thank you very much for wonderful design. And I too look forward to seeing this um, come to fruition. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Horan. Yeah, I try not to be repetitive, so I would just say whatever Commissioner Say just said, I second that she uh, kind of took all of the points that I was going to make. Parking and the, uh, the restaurant are the two main concerns I have. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to echo that. I, I think that the, the food trucks are a good way to mitigate some of that if we could guarantee it, but I don't know that that's going to happen. So um, I, I just don't know. I, I mean... I know that restaurants and it will work out there. I think that um, prepared food is, it could work. Um, but I think that, you know, made to order things are, would be a good option as well. And it doesn't have to be a bigger space. It could be another one. So, I, and I think if you give people options, like when you get a bunch of food trucks together, people like it because they can have a few things to choose from. So if you had a couple of cafes, um, it, it would really help out. And again, back to the parking, you got to have a place for some of the public to park, especially if we're going to have um, public meeting spaces there and just having people when they want to go out there and maybe have lunch if they really like whatever is there as a food opportunity. So um, I won't belabor the point. Um, that, those are my comments. Uh, does anyone else have any comments or would someone like to make a motion? Uh, so, Chair Gall, there's no need to have a motion as this will return for action, uh, given that it has environmental review. Okay. Um, I did want to add uh, just a little information about the streetscape, because I, I know there were a number of, of uh, kind of comments. And, and um, as, we, as I've been listening to the comments, I've been thinking about whether um, it would make sense. There, there's a um, Bayshore Highway Beautification Project that Public Works has been working on. And it does have some standards for trees and sidewalks and um, presumably lighting. 
things like that. Um, I realize the planning commission has not seen that in a formal way. Um, so perhaps that's something we can put on an agenda. Um, I can't promise it's, <laughs> I have to talk to public work, see if, if uh, that could be arranged, but given that it's this common thread uh, through uh, these various projects on the Bayfront and some of them will be building those improvements so that they are consistent with that plan uh, as the applicant alluded to. Um, it's a little trickier on the, the Bay Trail. Um, the Bay Trail in Burlingame is mostly on private property. Um, there are some segments that are on public property, which the city is able to control a little better. Um, but for example, if you're somebody wanted to coordinate a lighting standard on the Bay Trail, they need to um, get the cooperation of all the different property owners along the way. It's not impossible, but it's um, it's just a kind of unique um, situation in Berlin game. And that's also why we have the kind of um, stop and start pattern in the Bay Trail is uh, we are filling in the gaps, but um, it's all private property. Um, Commissioner Camarado. Yeah, Kevin, would this be something that um, Commissioner Lowenthal had brought up was, you know, maybe that these developers can put some money in a bucket and where it is some private, um, there is pri private property or BCDC that maybe that's where we could put some lighting because lighting would be much more advantageous for everyone um, throughout. So just a thought, maybe if we could look at if these developers are doing some big projects that we can do some funds, if we can get an idea of what that might look like, if the private ownership might be interested in doing something like that. Sure. And that's certainly an initiative and, you know, we can't promise, but um, there has been interest among property owners to start developing more consistent standards, just even things like trash cans and things like that. Um, so um, it is it is a discussion that is floating around, um, but uh, it does require a, a level of coordination that um, a typical public works project wouldn't wouldn't have. Um, not to say it's impossible, but uh, just wanted to let you know how it worked. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if we have no, um, we have no further comments on this, um, I think we can close this item. Is that correct, Kevin? All right, correct. and then, then um, we're gonna move on to uh, design review study item, item 9B, 1200 to 1340 Bayshore Highway. Um, if you are the applicant or the applicant's representative, please raise your hand so that we may be prepared for you to speak at the appropriate time. If possible, we ask that you also turn on your video at that time. Were any commissioners not able to visit the project site or do any commissioners wish to note any ex parte communications regarding this project? Uh, I see no hands. Uh, no commissioners are recusing from this item, I assume. So let the record note that all commissioners present have visited the project site. Can we have a staff report, please? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so tonight um, we have an environmental scoping hearing for the notice of preparation for the project at 1200 through 1340 Bayshore Highway. This is also referred to as the Peninsula Crossing. Uh, next. So uh, I'm gonna start just with an overview for you. Um, this is uh, about CEQA. Uh, some of you uh, know a little bit about CEQA, but um, CEQA is a state law that mandates that lead agencies identify and disclose any significant environmental effects uh, for a project in a jurisdiction and whether they are either um, avoidable significant environmental effects were feasible or if they can be mitigated um, were feasible. So City of Burlingame is the lead agency for this project. Um, so it is our uh, job to determine what the appropriate CEQA document would be. And uh, we have determined it is an environmental impact report or an EIR uh, for the proposed project at uh, 1200 to 1340 Bayshore. Uh, the CEQA process, I'm giving you guys a really big uh, kind of a 30,000 foot view, if you will. Um, it's basically, we identify the baseline. Uh, so that's exi existing in cumulative environmental conditions at the site. And then we define significance uh, thresholds for each topic. Um, then we conduct an impact analysis to look at the change between those uh, baseline and anticipated conditions. 
and then determine if there are impacts, either direct or indirect uh, physical changes to the environment. Next. So uh, just to kind of point out uh, this evening, the purpose of this meeting is for environmental scoping. Um, under the CEQA statute, um, as the lead agency, we are required to prepare what's called a notice of preparation or NOP. And that's basically an announcement saying that we've decided we're doing an environmental impact report for this project. Um, the NI NOP is required to be circulated for 30 days. We published uh, the NOP on Friday, August 12th, and the 30-day comment period runs through uh, Friday or uh, Monday, September 12th. So the purpose of this hearing tonight is to re receive comments from the Planning Commission, the public, and other agencies on the scope of the uh, environmental document that's to be prepared for this project. Next. Um, just to give you a little background, uh, the applicant has a more in-depth presentation, so I'm going to keep mine really short. Uh, just an overview is that this site is located north of Broadway um, and on the east side of Bayshore. Uh, the proposal includes 13 existing parcels that would be combined for a total of 12 acres. The general plan designation is Bayfront Commercial, and the zoning is also Bayfront Commercial. Next. The um, proposed project is going to be for three uh, life science or office or combination of both buildings to be determined with approximately 1.4 million square feet. Uh, there would be three main buildings uh, with 11 stories and there would be two parking structures, uh, 10 stories above grade with two levels below, approximately 3,500 parking spaces to be provided on site. Next. Um, the um, topics to be addressed in the environmental document are dictated in the CEQA checklist and the uh, information before you are all the categories that will be studied as part of the EIR document. Next. Um, the um, chart on this slide shows a summary of the CEQA process that's dictated by the CEQA statute and all the steps that are required for the um, EIR preparation. There are several opportunities for public comments and uh, tonight is one of them for the NOP hearing. Next. So some important dates that we're looking at as we kick off our CEQA uh, process. Uh, the NOP, as I noted, was published on August 12th. Tonight, we're having our scoping session and the end of the NOP comment period will be September 12th. Next. Um, as I noted, uh, members this evening may speak during public comment, and those will be uh, included in the NOP comments. You can also email us um, at the information provided on the screen. Uh, next. And we're also accepting comments all the way through uh, September 12th, and the information is provided on the screen to send those to me directly. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Kelly Beggs. She is with Good City Company. She is the contract planner that is also working on this project uh, with the city. And um, we're available if you have any comments. That concludes my presentation. Although one thing I wanted to add, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to point out that different from the project you just had before you, which was an environmental, um, I'm sorry, a design review study meeting. Tonight's meeting is an environmental scoping meeting. So the intent of this meeting is just to gather um, comments on the NOP for the environmental document that we're preparing. So I know there's a this is, is quite a, a big project with a lot of interesting information that the applicant will go over with you um, in just a few minutes. But just as a reminder, we're going to have a subsequent meeting for design review study in which we will take um, design comments. So if you could um, tailor your comments to um, issues to be addressed in the CEQA document, that would, um, that would be great. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff? 
I don't see any hands, so I'm going to open public hearing. Would the applicant please oh, come forward? I think Commissioner Faf has a question. Oh, um, sorry. Sure, sorry about that. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't find my hand. It's just a, a very, a, a, a real, hopefully black and white. So I understand this is a different animal than what we just did, but I did see, uh, I think transportation on there, or trans, some, something with transportation that to me means car. So are we not allowed to talk about parking or I, I'm, I'm just confused. Um, there is a section in the CEQA document that looks at transportation and circulation. So that would include um, things like traffic studies, um, um, access to, um, to pedestrian trails and uh, bicycle um, access on the site to and from the site and within the site. So those would be open to um, and part of the environmental review. Thank you. You're welcome. Although I would, um, Kevin, probably <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, generally, parking is not a, a, a CEQA issue, um, but we do look at uh, there generally our traffic impact analysis that is done for each project that looks at trip generation rates, uh, vehicle miles traveled, if that applies, um, as well as um, transportation demand management plans to reduce a single occupancy vehicle. So the, it, it's... Um, part of it and kind of not part of it in some way. So I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. That was exceedingly clear. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, do I have any other hands? Nope, okay, then I'm gonna open the public hearing. Would the applicant please come forward, state your name and anything else you'd like to add about your project? Uh, thank you, Chair Gall. Uh, uh, good evening, commissioners, staff, and members of the public. I'm Seth Bland with Divco West. And with me here this evening is Virginia Calkins, our senior development manager, and Kirk Syme of Woodstock Development, one of our partners on this project. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to briefly review Peninsula Crossing's uh, provisions for sea level rise protection, bay trail connectivity, trip reduction strategies, and other sustainability features under CEQA as we move into environmental scoping and we look forward to returning in the fall for a separate design review conversation. I'll now turn it over to Virginia to walk your commission through the relevant CEQA details. Virginia. Thank you, Seth. I had the pleasure of presenting this project to you, the Planning Commission, along with the City Council in a joint session in late April. And these slides are from that presentation. As we said then, and as we reiterate tonight, we are committed to setting the standard for development in Burlingame and the broader peninsula region. We aim to fulfill Burlingame's vision for the transformation of the Bayfront with this project. Peninsula Crossing will deliver to the city a myriad of community benefits, ranging from completion of the Bay Trail to economic development and from sea level rise to placemaking. First, a topic that's already gotten a lot of coverage tonight, the Bay Trail. One of the key benefits that Peninsula Crossing will deliver to the Burlingame community is the completion of the Bay Trail. This site is one of the few areas in the region where the Bay Trail simply stops. We will fill the quarter mile gap and provide a continuous pathway along the bay for residents and visitors alike. This depicts our proposed multimodal Bay Trail. In addition to the trail itself, a series of new pathways will connect Old Bay Shore Highway to the shore and create welcoming spaces along the water for people to exercise, explore, or simply watch planes land. Peninsula Crossing includes nearly four acres of landscaped public open space that will add to Burlingame Parks and Recreation Network. Some areas prioritize active play with fitness equipment and bike rental, while others are designed to be quiet, contemplative zones for enjoying nature. The open space welcomes a diversity of interests and audiences. A public plaza at the south becomes a welcome point to the Bayfront, supporting varied programming such as food trucks, art installations, or farmer stands. The south building will include a cafe offering food and beverage options open and accessible to the public and creating a dynamic, engaging waterfront space. We prioritize investment in public transit, bike and pedestrian connectivity, and transportation demand management strategies to reduce single occupancy vehicle traffic. The site is close to the Broadway Caltrain station, accessible over the newly improved pedestrian overpass. We are also planning new sidewalks, bike lanes, and intersection improvements to increase pedestrian and bicycle safety. 
We are committed to funding a commute.org publicly available shuttle to Millbrae, Caltrain, and BART, and including a stop shown here on our site. Peninsula Crossing will reintroduce native habitat to the bayfront. Drought resistant native plant species will flourish on the new living shoreline, a natural resilience strategy. The landscapes will be piped for reclaimed water and require minimal irrigation. We plan to plant 230 new trees on the site, creating valuable shade and habitat. We will implement bird safe building design measures to ensure a safe environment. Peninsula Crossing is also setting the standard for sea level rise resiliency. We've heard the city's priority of sea level rise protection and we are committing to spending tens of millions of dollars to create a levee and seawall system to protect the site and inland areas. In designing our proposed solution, we wanted to ensure that the protection for the future did not come at the expense of great park space today. By integrating earthen berms into the landscape and burying protective walls where necessary, we're proposing a solution that feels like a seamless natural shoreline and not like an oppressive seawall. The sea level rise infrastructure we construct at the Bayfront will provide protection to a large swath of the community inland, including 101, Rollins Road developments, and all of the housing and businesses on the coastal plain shown here in yellow. Sustainability is at the core of the Peninsula Crossing project. We are designing an all electric core and shell building for heating and cooling, which includes a high performance exterior envelope. The combination will result in a 73% reduction in carbon emissions compared to a typical gas fueled lab building. We were also taking great care to minimize water usage within the building and to design the landscape to retain and treat stormwater. We are proposing a density well under the allowed 3.0 FAR, but Peninsula Crossing will fulfill the city's general plan vision for this land, creating a life science hub within the greater peninsula. It will generate over 4,000 new full-time jobs with a range of skill sets, as well as many construction jobs and economic development in adjacent businesses. It will also deliver economic benefits to the city of Burlingame, including over tens of millions in fees and increased annual revenues. What we're most proud of is the place that we're creating on the Bayfront. We will transform abandoned parking lots and rundown buildings into a dynamic innovation hub situated within lush public open space along the bay. Thank you for the opportunity to present. We look forward to moving forward with the environmental review and scoping. Great, thank you very much. Um, do we have any app, uh, questions for the applicant? Uh, I don't see any hands, but I had a couple um, or concerns, I guess. Um, have you guys done research on what um, what the creek habitat used to have in there? I mean, I'm assuming there were some shorebirds and that kind of thing. And would those um, habitat um, issues be addressed in the design of and the, and the reworking of that creek? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Definitely one of the topics included in the environmental review is habitat and biological resources. And so we as applicant have done a lot of um, technical studies ourselves, but that will be part of the scope of ESA's work with the city to, to be studying the habitat there. Um, so th they'll come up with more concrete determinations, but it's something as applicant we're very concerned about that our landscape architect is engaged in and we've engaged a um, native habitat specialist in, in our design. Okay, thank you. Um, relating to traffic, I know that you said you're gonna do some work on the, on Broadway there. Um, and, and I see, I, I, you know, the, I saw the perspective and it looks good. I'm wondering about the connection to uh, Bayside Park. Um, if that's just gonna be on the surface or have you considered anything like a pedestrian walkway or pedestrian bridge or a tunnel or something like that. I'm just, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of activity on the weekends at Bayside Park and then a real busy street uh, to get over even to the Bay Trail. So I guess it sort of even dovetails in with a connection with the um, Bayside Park with the, with the, uh, with the Bay Trail. I just like yeah, that so address. We're definitely we're planning a crosswalk um, at the intersection of airport and Old Bayshore Highway. I think there's also another crosswalk further down airport. Um, 
that I think could support connectivity sort of closer to where the bathrooms are on Bayside Park. But it's definitely mm -hmm. something that we're open to when we come back for um, design review, further comment in terms of how to ensure we're integrating in the right places with the city's broader network of trails. Absolutely. Yeah, because I think that that should maybe be incorporated into the, the traffic study as well, because um, I, I, I'm anticipating a lot of pedestrian traffic there. Uh, my only other concern yeah, is just uh, the, the water demand of the building. I know that you said that, that you're going to um, be reusing the water for the landscaping and whatnot, um, but I'm just uh, wondering if there's been a, a water demand schedule made up for those buildings and if that fits in with the city's water allocations, because I know that we... Um, you know, at these times we've been reduced back on what we can use. So if that could be incorporated into the into the study. And those yeah, are the only absolutely. questions. It's, it's uh, we we provided at least the inputs on the water demand side, and I, and I think we'll be part of the overall study. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions of the applicant? Okay, I don't see any hands. Are there any um, members of the public who wish to speak on this item or were there any comments received through email or Zoom chat? Um, we're seeing some hands come up. Um, so we'll have the speakers speak first. And the first speaker was Leslie Flint. So we will have Leslie join as a panelist. There I am. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry, my picture isn't there. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so I'm Leslie Flint. I'm a member of Sequoia Audubon Society, which is the San Mateo County chapter of the National Audubon Society. We have approximately 1,400 members in San Mateo County. I wanted to speak about two issues. One is bird safe building practice, uh, dealing with bird safe building practices. Um, the I wanted to mention that there are 136 species of birds that have been documented along the Bay Trail in Burlingame, most during the winter months and during the spring and fall migration. Uh, it's to be noted that birds attempt to reach shelter food and migratory paths uh, through reflected glass. And it's been shown that over 100 million birds die annually from striking buildings with reflective transparent materials that cause collisions. And looking at the plans today for these buildings, I noted that you actually do have a plan for treated and untreated glass on the surfaces. However, it wasn't exactly clear what the proportions would be. And so I think it would be important to perhaps engage a, a qualified ornithologist to help you figure out how best to achieve bird-friendly design, you know, as Berlin Games General Plan has, has indicated. Um, one, of the, one of the agencies that Burlingame has suggested other developers look at is, as guidance is the, the San Francisco's bird safe standards. And they require no more than 10% of untreated glazing beginning at the grade and upwards for 60 feet. And this project seems to have a lot more than 10% untreated glass, but it's not clear how much. And so I think it would be good to have that defined. And I would also like to see more stringent requirements for those areas facing the Bay and Easton Creek. The other is second, the second, second is lighting. And I know you've talked about lighting in the last project you discussed, but it's important for birds because they're attracted to light at night to, um, and you've indicated, I know I did notice you indicated downward facing lighting on the outside of the buildings, which is good. Um, but we would encourage you to have this a building lights out program from dusk or 10 p.m. to dawn, having window blinds in areas requiring light at night and motion sensors to light only areas being actively used at night. Um, so those are my suggestions. Uh, and I, you know, I just encourage you to really take a look at what other, what other um, cities in the Bay Area have done for bird safe, bird safe uh, building practices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Gita Dev. Uh, Ms. Dev will join us as a panelist.
Uh, good evening. My name is Gita Dev, and I am with the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. I, I also wanted to bring up some impacts that I hope um, the EIR can look into. These, these might be a bit unusual, uh, but for the, from the aesthetic point of view, I would like to raise the issue about these parking garages, these multi-story parking garages blocking views of the bay. And I'm wondering if there's something that can be done to make them not as offensive as they might end up being. Um, I don't think when we en envisioned uh, additional buildings along the bayfront that we envisioned multi-story parking garages. So I'm wondering if there's some way that the parking garages can be treated so that they are more green, uh, so that they present green surfaces and so that their lighting, in fact, is, is um, not that they're not lit at night and that they only are lighted when somebody moves through them. It also brings up the issue of uh, complete streets and bike lanes. This is yet another example of why it's really important that they sure become a complete street uh, for all the, all the buildings that are going to go up along here. Another item I'd like to bring up is, uh, once again, the BSL levels. There's a, a safety issues biological in the biological section. They, these are extremely sensitive habitats along the bay. And in the event of liquefaction, this is all on uncompacted bay fill. In the event of liquefaction and a seismic event, the building structures can fail. And certainly the buried infrastructure can fail. Um, if we have BSL, say level three, where we have extremely infectious air, airborne diseases, um, such as you know, anthrax, for example, it, if the systems were to fail and we don't have positive pressure, then these are extremely important emergencies that need to be planned for. Therefore, once again, transparency for the biosafety levels of the labs that are incorporated is really important for all of us. Um, a third item is the, uh, the, the trees. It's really important that we not, from, from an environmental point of view, for the bird safety, it's important not to have trees along the bayfront where raptors and other predators can perch while birds are feeding. So I just urge you in your landscape design to look at the environmental impact of putting all those trees along the waterfront. And lastly, um, I'm somewhat concerned. I, I realize that you have talked to Sierra Club about the setback, the 100 foot setback. I'm still very concerned that I don't really see the extent of the ecotone levees on the bayshore side of the levees. So I'm wondering about the natural adaptation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another, someone else, Kevin? Uh, I don't see any more hands. We do have a number of emails. Uh, there's a total of seven right now. Um, so I will start with the first one. Uh, it is signed Jane. Uh, it says EGADS, no, 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 to the proposed development of 1.5 million square feet of new building at the intersection of Highway Broadway Highway 101 and Bayshore Highway. 11 and 10 story buildings, are you crazy to allow this even be in review? We went through this at the new Facebook development and it is too big at six stories. Please, please, please consider our community and not the tax dollars. Uh, the city of Burlingame does not need this huge development for some of the following reasons. Traffic, traffic, traffic. Broadway is already too busy and we will never be able to handle the traffic from the scale of this development. Utilities, uh, where's all the water, sewer, electric, et cetera, going to come from? We are in a drought and do not have enough now to meet our needs. The sewer treatment plant is at capacity and sometimes flows into the bay. This is going to aggravate the problem. Environmental, impacts to the bay and beyond with more carbon emissions, bay pollution from all the activity, cars and people at this development. Damage to the creek flows that drain into the bay through this site at two locations. These creeks should be opened up and expanded as environmental features, not buried in concrete. Earthquake impacts. The area is all landfill, and we know what happened in 1989 uh, when the hotel crashed into the lobby of the hotel. Uh, the area is sinking, and no more development of the scope will only make it worse. 
scenic views will be obstructed for of the bay for many, many folks. Community character, the scale and scope of this development is not in keeping with the character for the city of Burlingame. It will only be a modern monstrosity that will deflect from the historic character of our community. Please do not approve this development. The city of Burlingame does not need this project now or ever. Thank you, Jane. Uh, the next email is signed Robert Mead. It reads, uh, please do not approve this project. The city of Burlingame and surrounding areas do not have available housing for the workers that would be employed there. Furthermore, this will aggravate the traffic jams on Highway 101. We already have the new 500,000 square foot Facebook development at Coyote Point to somehow accommodate. Burlingame doesn't need this. It needs to be located in an area where reasonably priced housing can be provided and the associated traffic won't be a problem. Build some housing there instead. Thank you for listening, Robert Mead. Uh, next up is uh, email signed by Mark Goan. Uh, it reads, may I start off by saying, I think this is a very well-designed and beneficial project for the city. One concern I have that I'd like to see the EIR address is the integration of solar renewables. Looking at the renderings, I don't see any obvious solar installation. I'd like the project to possibly consider shaded solar on the parking garages, such as the city of Millbury, Alexandria, Life Sciences campus project is having installed. I feel if we are to really embrace these projects and their benefits, it's only right where possible to try and offset the demand of the electricity grid. Thanks, Mark Goan. Uh, next is Joan Renson. Greetings, I just wanna voice my opinion on this huge proposed new building at the Bayfront at Broadway. I say no to this building and I have just a few reasons. The area is already heavily congested and a mess at peak commute times and this building will just put it over the top. The current infrastructure does not support the size of a building at this location. The train tracks at Broadway are a joke and already I can't even imagine the traffic at lunchtime if anyone from this building wants to go for lunch. Broadway can't take this kind of traffic, car or people. There are also multiple buildings proposed for that down the road, for that road down the street anyway. Uh, Burlingame is not geared for such fast building development and we just don't want to lose our town to these big developers who don't care less about the rest of us who have to live and get around here. If we already do not have enough water for the current population, we certainly do not have the extra water to accommodate this building's needs, not to mention the load this will put on our sewer system. Taking it down to three stories would be a much better idea for this location. No, 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 and no, thank you. Uh, next up is email from Ethan Rebellos. It reads, as I mentioned earlier tonight, I'm excited about the new development along Bayshore Highway. My asks for this project are similar, but more significant than those for item 9A. Because of its location and scale, I expect lots of engaging outdoor space, many large-scale public arts and public, publicly accessible amenities for community meetings, a cafe, and a full-service restaurant bar. This development will displace some well-known and loved Burlingame businesses, and I ask that they be provided an opportunity to reopen at this new development. This location is reachable by pedestrians and bicyclists from the Broadway Caltrain Station, the shopping and dining district, and the surrounding neighborhoods. We need attractive pedestrian-scale lighting and wide sidewalks with shade trees along the street. Uplet trees would be great. The developer should submit a proposed plan to encourage bicycles with protected bicycle facilities. Of course, I strongly encourage a method for enhanced shuttle service between the facility, the Caltrain stations, Broadway, and Burlingame Avenue. Signed, thank you, Ethan Rebellos. Uh, next is an email signed by Nina Gooddale. Thank you, commissioners, for this opportunity to participate. I'm Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter member involved in environmental conservation as a vital way for all to enjoy nature. It's great that the Bayfront Commercial Zoning District includes as its purpose the enjoyment of nature and public access to the Bay. In that regard, I'd like to note that the applicant met with a number of us some time ago and expressed a willingness to collaborate to protect the wetlands ecosystem by eliminating the bridge shown as site feature four in volume two of the project design plans. Perhaps the fact that this bridge remains in the current project plan is simply an oversight. Therefore, it would be great to see this bridge eliminated as an essential environmental protection and conservation measure. Thanks again for your consideration and dedicated public service, Nina Goodale. 
And then last is uh, signed by Zach. Uh, hello, commissioners. I'm excited about the enhancements to the Bay Trail. The area is already one of my favorite parts of our city, and I love the new public spaces. A few things stick out about the 1200 1340 Bayshore project parking. Two 10 story parking garages seems excessive for how much office space there is. I'm not sure what the standard ratio is, but there is a lot of space right next to our beautiful Bay Trail being used for car storage. This location is very close to Broadway Station, which is already a commute.org shuttle stop from Millbrae. Uh, maybe some of the money going towards parking can instead go towards increased service for another, another shuttle from Millbrae, or perhaps they can share some parking with the nearby hotels. Bay Trail Maintenance. More people enjoying the Bay Trail is certainly a good problem, but I think it would be a small drop in the bucket for the developer to help this financially and would go a long way for our city. This project specifically is right on a patch of Bay Trail with a discontinuation of the trail where some improvements could be made. Jobs, housing, and balance. These projects are adding a lot of high paying jobs to our area and increasing demand for housing in an area without considering how it will affect the already worsening housing affordability crisis. I understand we can't currently build residences east of 101, but think we need to address housing supply as we're adding demand for housing. Thank you for your time, Zach. And those are all of the public comment emails we've received. All right, thank you. Um, then if there are no other questions of the applicant, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Um, commissioners, do you have any comments or any further um, items that you'd like to see incorporated into the environmental documents? Uh, Vice Chair Foff. Okay. Um, yeah, I do have a list. Um, so first of all, I, I guess this would be geology. Um, I sure would find it important to look into the liquefaction issue if that is one there and how uh, any buildings, um, these or others uh, there could be, um, uh, what, what the effect would be I think that's really important. Um, I would like to, uh, to know um, about the wind effect of, uh, these are really tall buildings. So uh, the wind effect possibly um, generally, and then on the recreational area where I forgot the name of the baseball field, but um, a few people have asked me specifically about the baseball field. Um, and so how the wind patterns might or might not affect the baseball uh, games um, or whatever's happening over there. Um, I would also like to ask um, about the view corridor. Um, so there's a page I couldn't find, I'm not sure it matches up exactly on the big, on the big bunch of uh, diagrams, but it's AS page ENT AS-151. It shows view corridors as they look, I believe, towards the bay, but I'm wondering, uh, isn't there some study of the view from the, the bay to the mountains? There are mountains there. What the opposite direction? So um, would find that uh, kind of important because they, I think there's some blockage there um, more than what we have now. Um, would also like to ask, um, well, make sure I see there uh, historical and uh, cultural. Um, I believe there was a, uh, in the vicinity of, of Broadway, there was a a Chinese fishing village, probably some Indian fishing villages there. And um, there are documents from the county if, they, if the um, applicant would like to uh, have a reference. Um, I think that would be important. Um, and perhaps, you know, something should be called out in your project if it goes ahead uh, that, that these activities um, happen there. Additionally, there is a, um, that Hyatt Theater in the Round that uh, realized the building itself probably is no longer, would no longer qualify as historic because it's been changed a lot, but it should be looked into it sort of as a cultural uh, 
it has a famous architect pair and was a, an effort to bring some kind of culture and activity to Burlingame and the peninsula and um, sort of a, a trend of having something available for tourists from SFO. And at the time we really didn't have much uh, around here in the way of restaurants and such and entertainment. Um, so I would like that um, at least looked into. Um, and so I understand we're not really supposed to talk about parking, but I, there's, there is a crossover. I, um, there are 20 spots called out for um, Bay Trail visitors. And I'm just, I'm not understanding um, if this is supposed to be a destination, I'm, I'm not understanding how the flow and everything will work and uh, where the people are all supposed to be coming from if they're if they're only 20, I don't know. Anyway, get the idea. Um, don't wanna go the wrong direction on that. And um, let's see, I think I have a few items that I'll talk about later when we get to design review, but so it's view corridors, wind. Oh yes, shadow patterns. Um, these are again very large buildings, and they are very close to the um, trails that you are um, completing. And so, I wanted to ask, what what are those patterns exactly? And um, during the day, so I'd like to ask that. Um, okay, I think I have. Oh yeah, and finally, I see there you have. Um, you're suggesting some benefits, which we're not talking about right now, but it mentions that this is a phased project. So I'm curious with the things you're planning, how does that work in a phased project? But um, if it's taking three years to complete this, uh, is there a way to phase it so that the we get, there are some benefits while the detriments are being caused um, or is it, I mean, I guess to equalize that, to have, a, to have a, a, a real program in the case that this would only be partially realized. I guess, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but thank you for, um, for being patient with my questions. Thank you. Uh, any other commissioners have uh, comments or questions? Um, I would also just like to include the, um, if there will be uh, piles driven on this project or how the foundation is um, going to be done. Because I remember at the Facebook project, I got comments from some of the neighboring businesses about how long that had been going on. So um, if we could look into that. Okay, um, I don't see any other hands. So, and there is no motion on this. Is that correct, Kevin? Uh, that's correct. There is one thing I just want to mention for the public. Uh, so yeah, there's no motion. This will come back uh, for, first of all, for design review at a, a later date, and then um, ultimately for action um, when the EIR is completed. Um, we do want to emphasize that the uh, we're in the midst of a comment period for the EIR. That comment period ends on uh, September 12th at 5 p.m. So if uh, people do want to submit comments related to the EIR scope. Uh, they have a, up until 5 p.m. on September 12th. Um, information can be found in the staff report um, as well as on the project page on the city's website. And Director Gunner, just to, to add to that, this is the comment period for the, the NOP, the Notice of Preparation. And there will be additional comment periods later too when the draft EIR comes out. Thank you, yeah. Uh, Important clarification, the EIR uh, has not been produced yet. Okay, thank you. Um, and so there's no motion on this. Um, so we can move on to agenda item number 10. Uh, commissioner's reports, do we have any commissioner's reports? No, I see no hand. And are there any director's reports? Uh, let's see, let me make sure we don't have a, sorry, I have to be prepared for this. Uh, there are no FYIs. Um, I will mention at a city council meeting on August 15th, last Monday, there was a update of the town square project. 
and um, that project is moving along in the design phases. The schematic design has been completed and they're now moving into design development and from their construction documents and hopefully construction. If uh, people are curious to see the schematic design, the slides are on the project webpage at berlingame.org slash town square. And um, those of you, uh, I think it was in a joint meeting back in 2020 or 2021, um, 2021, um, a number of, of the commissioners looked at a conceptual design of the town square. Um, I think you'll see the schematic design looks very similar, uh, just with CAD-based drawings as opposed to hand-drawn drawings, but um, very much the same kind of idea of rows of trees and um, different uh, activity areas and terraced seatings and things like that. So um, you're welcome to look at that. And um, uh, that, was, uh, that was the main action from the city council meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, then I think that we have nothing else. So I am going to adjourn this meeting at 920 p.m. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, everyone. Night. Night.